Oh, I'm sorry, are you waiting on me? Yeah, see, that's the problem. In the classroom of life, there's no waiting. The classroom of life is always teaching, so therefore it expects that all of us are always going to be learning. So if we want to be successful students in the classroom of life, there's one simple principle that we're going to have to believe in. We're going to have to believe in this. All learning is self-directed. All learning. It doesn't make any difference if there's a sage on the stage, a professor at a podium, a tutor at the table. It doesn't make any difference if we're learning in the sandbox, learning in the workplace, or learning in the classroom. All learning is self-directed, and that's particularly true for lifelong learning. I mean, we talk a good game around lifelong learning, right? Who wouldn't want to be a lifelong learner? It's not like I'm going to come up to one of you during the break and say, what do you think of lifelong learning? And you're going to pause and say, hey, I think I did lifelong learning four or five years ago. I tried it, but it really wasn't for me. <laughs> right? But unpack those words. Life, long, learning. What does it mean to learn when we're going to be living longer? How do we live a life where we continue to long to learn? I'm going to suggest to you that to live a life of learning is going to require us to design our lives around two core principles, increasing diversity, ongoing discovery. Increasing diversity and ongoing discovery. Increasing the diversity of the people that we hang out with, the places that we go, the things that we do, the experiences that we have, and the content that we consume. And as we bring that diversity into our lives, we meet it and we engage with it with ongoing discovery. Open-mindedness, a beginner's mind, curiosity. But that's not quite as easy as it sounds, as evidenced by this quote from Edward de Bono, who's a great author who writes quite a few books about creative thinking. De Bono reminds us that we start school as a question mark and we end as a period. When we began learning, we started off with a box of 64 crayons, and when we graduate, we have one blue pen. <laughs> Man, I miss burnt sienna, don't you? <laughs> I don't take that as a formal indictment on our educational system, although I suppose you could. I take that to be the circle of life, Simba. It's not a linear path, though. It's a circle of life. The challenge for us is to bring that increasing diversity back into our life to rebuild our box of 64 crayons. But here's the deal. I imagine some of you are already saying, dude, I got way too much in my life right now. I'm surrounded by information. I've got content up to my head. I can barely keep up on the things that matter most to me. And you're standing up there on a friggin' red carpet telling me I need to go hang out with people that I don't know that I'm going to like, do things that I don't know if they're going to have any interest for me? Are you kidding me? No, I'm dead serious. Because we don't suffer from attention deficit disorder. We suffer from intention deficit disorder. When you have a clarity of intention, you choose to pay attention in different ways. And if our intention is to live a life of learning, to be a lifelong learner, the thing that we have to embrace is increasing diversity. And if that is our intention, then we are going to have no problem expanding the scope of our intention to include more information, to bring in more stimuli. But when we do that, we have to recognize a really important thing. We've got to meet it with ongoing discovery. Meg Wheatley, one of my favorite authors, gives us some good counsel for how we can meet those diverse perspectives with a commitment to ongoing discovery. Meg says, we don't have to let go of what we believe, but we do need to be curious about what other people believe. Because when we bring diversity into our lives, we're going to find people who don't see the world the way we do and we have to meet that with ongoing discovery. I mean, the Quakers have a wonderful tradition in their faith. They believe that everyone holds a piece of the truth. A box of 64 crayons has a whole lot of truth in it. One blue pen causes us to think of our truth as universal truth. Our perspective must be the way everyone else sees the world. So if we want to meet that increasing diversity in our life with a commitment to ongoing discovery, there's four simple words you need to build into your routine. Four simple words. What were they thinking? What are they thinking? Years ago, I went on vacation with some friends to France, and I had been several times, and it was a fantastic Sunday morning. We went to a little neighborhood bistro, and we had been out pretty late the night before, truth be told, and one of the guys in our group kept looking around, and he said, man, I hope the waiter comes by soon with a pot of coffee. He's like, I really need a pot of coffee. And I chuckled, and he said, no, what are you laughing? He's like, I need some caffeine. 
And I said, well, what I'm laughing at is there are no pots of coffee in France. <laughs> I mean, this isn't IHOP or Perkins, I, you know. <laughs> I, I get what you want, you're going to get a cup of coffee, but there aren't going to be refills in, I don't know, I've been to France three times and I don't think I've ever seen a pot be dropped off at a table. And he scrunched up his face in all seriousness and with a really heavy sigh, he said, that is the most egregious affront to humankind I have ever heard. Because... <laughs> I don't doubt that you use these four words already. I'm just skeptical that we use them with that open-minded, curious discovery intonation of, what were they thinking? No, we might do it with a snide aside, what were they thinking? <laughs> or maybe the voice of indignation at that lack of a coffee pot, what were they thinking? That's not learning, though. And if we want to be lifelong learners and we bring in this increased diversity of people, of perspectives, of content into our world, we're going to have to train ourselves to let go of our truths in order to entertain the possibility of others' truths. And that's not only true for us as lifelong learners, that's actually how designers innovate products and environments. And so I want to give you an example of this, what were they thinking from our everyday lives? What were they thinking? that led them to move from the product on the left to the product on the right? What were they thinking that said, we can charge people three times as much <laughs> for one-third as much product? I, I'm pretty sure there was no focus group, there was no consumer research where a participant said, now, I just want to make sure I have the question straight, you're going to give me a lot less, and I'm going to pay a lot more, right? Yeah, sign me up for that. There was no research that backed that up. But what the produce manufacturers had done is they had diversified the places that they looked for information that might inform the value that they were trying to create. They noticed at this time that Boston Market was one of the fastest growing food chains. What was the slogan of Boston Market? Home style meals. At the same time, people were buying more food from the prepared food lines in grocery stores. And when they stepped back and they tried to figure out what they could discover from these disparate sources of information, what they uncovered was this. People wanted the experience of cooking, but the convenience of not actually doing it. And they would pay for it. As a result, three times as much for one-third as much product. There's actually a name to this process. It's called abductive logic, the logic of what could be. And I think that's what we have to embrace as lifelong learners, and that's what increased diversity and ongoing discovery will bring to us. Roger Martin, who's soon to retire as the dean of the Rotman School of Business at the University of Toronto, talks about this process in his book, The Design of Business. Abductive logic asks us to creatively assemble the bits and pieces of information that we bring in from these diverse sources and then make a logical leap to the best conclusion. The more pieces of the truth that we bring in through our commitment to increasing diversity, the more likely we're not only going to understand the human condition, but that we're going to discover a more logical leap, a more innovative solution. That's what lifelong learning is all about. And I was reminded of this in a metaphorical way earlier this month when I was in Chicago attending a professional conference. Um, I decided while I was there it would be good for me to rack up some personal continuing education credits in my quest to be recertified as a respectable gay man for 2013. <laughs> so I attended a musical. <laughs> yeah. Sunday in the Park with George, which is the Stephen Sondheim, James Lapine, Pulitzer award-winning musical about the artist George Seurat, who is an Impressionist painter, and his masterpiece, A Sunday Afternoon on the Island La Grande Jatte, which hangs prominently in the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, Seurat didn't paint like the other artists of his time, using broad brushstrokes on the canvas. Instead, he used the painting technique of pointillism, placing small dots of color of light, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of them on his canvas in close proximity to each other. And when we as the viewer engage with that through our lens, we create new colors and give new form and new shapes to the characters in the painting. And it hit me, this is what lifelong learning is about, putting dots of color on the canvas. The musical ends with these words from Seurat, white, a blank page or canvas, his favorite, so many possibilities. All learning is self-directed. If we want to live a life of learning, for learning, we have to increase diversity and ongoing discovery. Um, it's your life, it's your learning, it's your curriculum, it's your canvas. 
so many possibilities. Thank you.